Hey there again, it's Christy, and I am going to be reading chapter one from my doctoral thesis, Sex and Gender as Sources of Heterogeneity in British Political Attitudes and Behavior. Yes, I know, very sexy title, right? But um, if you're catching on to this, you've probably already listened to the introduction. If you haven't listened to the introduction, go back and listen to that, because you might be kind of confused if you don't. But for those of you who have and are nerdy enough to stick with it, well, hey, join the nerd club. It's nice to have you here geek and I'm going to continue on. Now from time to time, um, just as a reminder, you're only going to see the screen, you're not going to see me, and I'm only doing one take of these, so if I stumble over words or if I read things wrong, you're just going to have to deal with it. Um, my suggestion would be to treat it more like a podcast because unless you want to read along on the screen, it would be pretty boring. I couldn't come up with I couldn't think of good images to put up over the top of it and it would just delay the publication of it anyway in terms of uploading it to YouTube. So I'm not doing that. Um, I'm just going to read it out and you guys are here to listen. I'm going to adjust my chair here a little bit. My apologies. Okay, and occasionally I might stop for a glass of water and that's just to stop my mouth from getting really super dry. <clears throat> Chapter 1, Analyzing the Gender Gap. The aim of this thesis is simple, to determine whether separate measures for sex and gender provide unique explanation for an individual's political attitudes and behaviors. However, testing this simple question is not as easy as framing it. To set the stage for the terms, concepts, and theoretical frameworks that are employed throughout this thesis, a substantial number of ideas must be introduced, explained, and then conceptually linked. The purpose of this chapter is to lay that theoretical groundwork. It opens by reviewing the terms sex and gender to explain their different uses in popular culture and establish how they will be used in this investigation. Next, I explain why investigating sex and gender as explanatory variables require investigation research in political science. In the third section, I briefly review the history of sex differences and political attitudes and behaviors in the United States, the political context from which most gender gap theories have been developed, and survey the competing theories currently employed in American political science research. In addition, as this thesis differentiates between biological sex and the socially constructed notion of gender, I provide a brief overview of sociological theories of gender identity. Following on from that, I introduce two concepts that are fundamental to this research, agency and communion, and make the case that these two psychological measures underpin much of the American gender gap theory. Finally, given that this is a study of British men and women, I review the history of sex as an explanatory variable in British politics by examining the results of political science research to date. And of course, that was the date of my publication of my research in 2009, but I was writing it sort of 2006 to 2009. As mentioned above, before beginning an investigation into the existence and extent of sex and gender differences in men and women's political behavior and preferences, it is necessary to provide definitions for the terms that will be used throughout this thesis. In the media and in popular culture, there is a tendency to conflate the terms sex and gender. However, my analysis will use the terms to represent distinct concepts. The term sex will refer to the biological category of either male or female. The term gender will be used in this chapter in reference to the socially constructed notions of masculinity and femininity. Although this thesis is not focused on investigating uh, is, sorry, Start again. Although this thesis is not focused on investigating the role of biological sex as a material cause, causal source of political difference, the biological measure of sex should not be conceived of having a simplistic, uniform effect on all respondents. There may exist a range of biological differences within and between the sexes which might contribute to variation in political attitudes and behaviors. Biological sources of political attitudes and behaviors can be found in the work of Alfred et al., who found genetics play a role in political attitudes and that variation in the genetic makeup of individual men and women may contribute to their political orientation. Fowler found that there is evidence of an explanatory role of genetics in turnout behavior, and it is possible that such genetic explanations have a role to play in understanding the causal relationships of biological sex differences and similarities in men and women's political behavior. Although I have included 
Although I included a, as a traditional demographic variable of sex as a simple conceptual binary of male and female, the range of potential biological variation which underlies this simple binary should be kept in mind. The importance of distinguishing between sex differences and gender differences was highlighted by a recent publication. Campbell and Winters demonstrated that British men and women are interested in different types of political issues. Our findings showed that men express a higher level of interest in partisan politics, foreign policy, and foreign policy than women, while women express higher levels of interest in news items about education or the NHS than men. This is an example of a sex difference in political interest. In addition, our statistical analyses indicated that when individuals that individuals with a high sense of their own agency, whether male or female, were more likely to be interested in partisan politics and foreign policy, and that men and women who had a high score on measure of, of connection with others were more likely to be interested in domestic political issues. As the measures of agency and communion are derived from measures of gender used in psychology, those distinctions could be called gender differences. In addition, Campbell's and Winter's results point to the effect of the traditional sexual division of labor on interest in politics, and possibly the mutable effects of life, life cycle factors on the sex variable, which should be considered. Men's interest in politics was consistent across the age cohorts. However, there was a curvilinear relationship in women's interest in politics. Women in their teens and early 20s report similar levels of interest in politics as men in that age group, which is followed by a steep decline for women's self-rated political interest during their childbearing and child-rearing years. After this decline, women in their 50s and 60s report similar levels of interest in politics as their male counterparts at levels comparable to those of men and women in their teens and early 20s. Within this earlier investigation, then, there are three types of sex slash gender differences. One, sex differences in issue preference. Two, differing levels of interest in politics by sex-related life cycle. And three, gender differences in the types of political issues in which agentic or communal individuals express interest. This finding suggests this finding indicates that sex and gender are relevant in accounting for the observed patterns in British political behavior. When beginning an analysis of what is often referred to as the gender gap, a linguistic distinction between a sex gap and a gender gap is an important, to, is an important one to articulate. Although sex remains a stable biological category over the course of one's life, the social construction of gender and society's views of appropriate gender roles or gendered characteristics have altered over time. And just as a side note, I have referred above that gender for the most part remains a stable category. Um, and and that I repeated that, I had that line in the introduction. And although I said sex remains stable here, um, I do in the thesis make an effort to point out that there are some exceptions to the stability of sex as we have you know, uh, increasing awareness of transgendered issues. I'm gonna just pause here for a drink of water. Shifts in, the normal, um, shifts in the norms of appropriate gender roles, especially since the rise of second wave feminism in the West, are hypothesized to have, have an impact on people's political preferences and behaviors. Therefore, gender gaps in political attitudes and behaviors must be considered in light of wider social changes. This thesis will do so by conceptually and operationally separating out the concepts which are associated with gender from the stable biological category of sex. Previous studies of men and women's political behaviors and attitudes attempted to account for differences in political outcomes by referring to the impact of childhood and adulthood socialization, feminism, rational choice theory, generational differences, or the division of household labor on men and women. However, these studies often only use the biological measure of sex to differentiate between individuals. This thesis will report on the results of a study that incorporated separate measures of sex and gender into a political science survey. In doing so, I aim to provide a clearer understanding of this distinct explanatory power of sex and gender as individual variables on men and women's political attitudes and behaviors in Britain. Why examine political preferences in terms of sex and gender? <clears throat> 
In the course of my investigation into what is called gendered political behavior, a phrase which covers both sex-based and gender-based political analysis, and in this doctoral investigation in particular, I initially struggled to explain my own interest in this topic. Why investigate political attitudes and behaviors in light of sex and gender? Why bother expanding upon sex, a demographic variable which does not offer much in terms of explanatory power when used in model testing? Or to sum up these concerns more blunt bluntly, assuming there are some small differences between men and women on political measures, so what? One reason to study the impact of an individual's sex and gender on political preference is that sex, unlike other demographic variables, is a simple binary variable that is very nearly universally applicable. If the simple fact of being born a male or female has an impact upon how, a how an individual perceives the world and political events or situations, then the biological category sex may contribute a stable amount of the variance explained in the analysis of political decision making across nations and political systems. If a man or a woman is influenced by a socially constructed notion of appropriate masculine or feminine perspectives, then the social category, gender, or the psychological characteristics associated with a particular gender may contribute a portion of variance explained in the analysis of political decision making across political systems and cultures. It could be argued that there is no compelling reason to study sex and gender differences in Britain because there are not the large systematic gender gaps in voting vote choice as in the United States. However, recent empirical research reveals evidence that points to the influence of sex and gender in political decision making. In the absence of extensive information about a candidate, British men and women draw upon gendered frameworks for evaluating political le leaders. Recent research has found the existence of sex differences in political issue preferences, and as mentioned above, that sex and gender differences may influence an individual's interest in politics. For social scientists interested in explaining an individual's political views and decisions, it is useful to know the extent to which distinct sex and gender patterns can be found within political attitudes and behaviors. Regardless of whether or not sex or gender differences in political preferences always add up to sex or gender gaps affecting political outcomes, it is important to have a clear understanding of if, when, and how sex and gender frameworks impact the way in which men and women think about politics. It adds to our understanding of political calculations if we can determine if, when, and how sex and or gender frameworks may result in either identical or different political outcomes. Kimura addressed the value of investigating sex differences in light of the vast similarities men and women share. In her book, Sex and Cognition, she writes, if we want to develop an accurate account of how people's problem-solving behaviors originate, we cannot a priori willfully exclude any potential source of variation across individuals. It is not only unjustified scientifically to take such a biased view of how behaviors are determined, it is contrary to common sense. The business of science is to find out how the world really works, not how it ought to work according to some wishful schema or another. Scientific explanations change as more information comes in, but at any point in time, a scientific analysis attempts to encompass all the relevant facts. A note of caution may be warranted at this point. Regardless of what, whether one is reviewing biological or psychosocial variables, it is important to avoid making essentialist claims about men and women. It is unreasonable to make a claim such as all women or all men possess certain characteristics, values, or outlooks, or to expect such a measure to be found. Each individual, male or female, will have a combination of factors influencing their political decisions. Carol Tavris contrasted two conflicting perspectives of gender differences, essentialism and social constructionism. The essentialist perspective, as defined by Bohan, regards gender-related traits, behaviors, and attitudes as being internal, persistent, and consistent across time and situations. In the view of social constructionists, however, there is no essence of masculinity and femininity, for these are concepts and labels, for these concepts and labels are endlessly changing. Tavris writes, Unlike essentialist theories, which regard gender as the independent variable, if I know whether you are a man or a woman, I can predict how aggressive you are, 
Constructionist approaches regard gender as the dependent variable. Constructionists want to know what factors predict how we come to define ourselves, label ourselves, and behave as men or as a man or a woman or something else. Pause for a water break again. Tavris then lists four points that highlight the intellectual pitfalls of essentialism's false imposition of gendered limitations. First, she notes that essentialism confuses snap snapshots with blueprints. Studies of gender provide us with a snapshot of individuals within a certain time frame, but trends can change over time. One example is that sex differences in verbal and mathematical skills have decreased, but by generalizing a snapshot into a blueprint, some may infer that a difference reported in a given study is an essential and inherent disparity between the sexes, and, then, and could then wrongly conclude that there are more profound differences between men and women than there may be in reality or over time. In her second point, Tavris notes that essentialism falsely universalizes a trait or attitude. This is something which Tavris uses as a critique specifically against biological research. She gives the example of a study based on only 14 human brains, which reported a sex difference in the size and shape of the neurological connector between the two hemispheres of the brain, the corpus callosum. These initial findings and speculation as to their implications received a lot of attention when the study was first published. However, attempts to replicate the findings in 22 other studies conducted since 1982 found no difference at all. Tavris thus showed the danger of universalizing findings based on small sample sizes. As her third point, Tavris argues that essentialism fosters stereotypic thinking. An example of the error of this type of uh, sorry, as an example of the error of this type, the popular stereotype that women talk more than men. However, recent research found that women do not consistently talk more than men. Rather, it depends on the context in which men and women are speaking. According to Marianne LaFrance, the research is consistently showing either no sex differences in the amount that men and women talk, or if there is a difference, then it depends on the context. For example, in a professional context, men actually outspeak women by a long shot. Researchers who avoid essentialist stereotypes will be more alert to other potential influences for an observed behavior. As mentioned above, when analyzing how much men and women talk, the context in which the conversations take place is important, in a professional or a casual setting, for instance. When analyzing how men and women communicate, Tavers' critique on the use of stereotyping men and women's gendered attitudes and behaviors is especially relevant to the ways in which other studies have attempted to use sex to capture stereotypical gender roles. Tavers writes, the essentialist stereotype that men are unemotional or cold and women are emotional and warm also causes us to overlook situations in which men and women are permitted to be expressive and those in which both must suppress feelings. It causes us to overlook the way culture, social grade, occupation, age, and situation affect whether and how people will express their feelings and to whom. Finally, Tavris raises the critique that essentialist theories conflate sex with circumstances, noting that many apparent gender differences vanish when the, anal the analyst takes into consideration context, power relations, etc. Refuting the dichotomous assumption that women make, more, make moral decisions based on compassion and caring, and men make decisions based on the abstract notion of justice adopted in much of the American gender gap literature. Tavers notes that this sort of stereotypical thinking fails to take into account the fact that men and women employ both compassion and justice when making moral decisions dependent upon the situation they are in and or reasoning about. In light of Tavers's observation that previously observed sex differences do not constitute pronouncements on what all men or women do or think, we can say that recent British research into sex differences provide insights into, but not universal, assertions about men and women's attitudes and behaviors. In many analyses of political outcomes, the demographic variable sex in and of itself may not produce significant gaps in terms of the vote choice. 
However, British analysis shows that the sex variable interacts with other demographics and that these interactions result in patterns of distinct political preferences among subgroups of men and women. An interaction between age cohort and sex, described as the gender generation gap, is a documented phenomenon in which women born since the Second World War have become increasingly left-leaning in terms of political ideological space. Recent research indicates there are gender generation gaps in issue preferences. For example, Campbell analyzed 2001 British election study data and reported that women were more likely to prioritize education, especially younger women, or health care, especially older women, while men were more likely to cite the economy as the most important, with men between the ages of 55 and 59 expressing the most concern about the European Union. Such results indicate that the sex variable has interaction effects on other demographic measures and that this should be taken into account when trying to account for people's political decisions and preferences. Cognizant of Chavros's criticisms, I avoid the first critique of essentialism by limiting the inferences of my finding to the time period in which my survey data was obtained. The inclusion of gender measures into a political science survey certainly provides a snapshot of how men and women responded to the questions in January of 2007, but several more snapshots surveys must be taken before we can discuss gender, sex or gender trends in political attitudes. I also try to avoid the trap of essentialism by not generalizing beyond my own exploratory data set. The analyses I present in chapters 4 and 5 provide a definitive answer to the question, do separate measures for sex and gender provide separate explanation for an individual's political attitudes and behaviors? But these findings must be replicated with further, thir with further nationally representative probability samples before they can be generalized to the wider British public. To avoid stereotypes, I will discuss sex and gender measures as having associations with specific political behaviors or attitudes instead of asserting claims as to what women or men think. As to Traverse's observation of the need to take into account the conflation of sex with circumstances, I attempt to control for the effects of other influences on political attitudes and behaviors by including control variables so as not to misestimate the role of sex and gender as explanatory variables. There are many factors other than sex or gender, for example, partisan identification, education, parenthood, attention to politics, or other events, which may exert a much stronger influence on individual men and women's immediate political preferences and or decisions. However, the goal of this thesis is not to find the explanation with the biggest adjusted R-square, but rather to test and incorporate new measures in order to more accurately assess and understand the role of sex and gender in British political attitudes and behaviors. In conclusion, there are several compelling empirical reasons to accurately assess what role, if any, sex and or gender play in political calculations. The next sections review the history of gender gap analysis in the United States, where the gender gap was first observed, and in the United Kingdom. A brief history of the gender gap is provided with an explanation of how gender gaps can emerge, as well as a summary of the theories that dominate the American study of the gender gap. However, as American gender gap theories are not the primary influence focus of my investigation, only an overview of the United States literature is provided. Instead, more attention will be paid to documenting gender gap findings in the United Kingdom in order to provide the reader with the relevant historical and theoretical developments in the British context. A later chapter will test the American gender gap theories with British data in order to determine if American gender gap theory can inform British gender gap study. Thus, familiarity with the American theories is necessary. Right, so I think I'm going to stop there. Do the next section. I will see how many minutes. It feels about 20 minutes. And it was about 23 going on 24. And so that's the first section of chapter one in sex and gender as sources of heterogeneity. And for those of you who are still here, still listening, and still interested, I will do another video with the next section very soon. So thanks for listening all the way to the end of the video. I have been Christy. You are always awesome. And I'll talk to you guys later.